Well, good morning, or afternoon, or evening, depending on whatever time you might be watching this. So, due to the weather conditions, uh, we're not having service at Saundersville United Methodist Church today. Um, it, the extreme cold is one factor, but that has uh, kind of yielded itself to our parking lot being a complete sheet of ice, even uh, this afternoon, uh, Saturday afternoon and with uh you know highs in the low teens and uh getting down to two or zero tonight it's not going to be a whole lot better um tomorrow morning so um for safety reasons we'll have church this way um and hopefully you got this link in the email or on facebook um uh, or on text so uh glad to have you with us Oh, uh, however you're with us, I will be gone next week, the last Sunday in uh, January, and Laura will be uh, filling the pulpit, so uh, just because the cat's away, mice don't go play, so uh, she'll have a, a good message for you then. Um, other announcements, just so you know what's going on, um, our... Uh, Hendersonville Pastors Breakfast that was supposed to be this last Thursday. Uh, we postponed that because of weather. We will be having that this coming Thursday morning. So uh, just to let you know about that. Uh, other things on the bulletin, which you don't have. Um, let's see. Uh, we will not have uh, brunch after church today. At least not there. You may have it at your own home or wherever you like to brunch um march 3rd march 3rd 6 30 uh we'll restart with our uh, sunday night live things i mean january's almost gone um february has a lot of a lot of things going on um also but we'll be starting um march 3rd 6 30 with a uh, Sumner County resident, he's a, an author and a poet, uh, Craig Earlwine. He uh, has several books um, with titles in them of things like Writings of a West Virginia Paper Boy, and then, but they're all sort of in that series. But some really uh, interesting things that he's written, and uh, look forward to having him with us and. Um, uh, learning a little bit more about him and, and his writings, and I think you'll enjoy it. So um, tell everybody about that. All right. So, well, this will have to be a little bit modified, but that's okay. Um, from Isaiah 60, verse 1 says, Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. And... We'll just go right to our prayer list, which has a couple of uh, additions from last week, but uh, we want to continue to keep all of these people uh, that are on our list in our prayers. Bunny Weller, the Chambers family, Thomas Ryan, Willie and Rosie Wright, Charles Gray, the Bachman family, Jesse Pappas, Rob Siebold, Bruce Anderson, Kent Pointer, and Jonathan Pointer, the Moriarty's grandson, Teresa Robinson, Allison and Carl Wolhopter, Dana Cantrell, Faye Weaver's cousin, Ann Morlock, Michelle Wright and Cheryl Wright, Joan Harris, Tim and Edwina Ulmer, Rose and Ted Brauner, Joan Harris, Brad and Faye Waldrop, Jerry and Beverly Pounds, Linda Peem, Helen, a.k.a. Aunt Booby, Roy Moriarty, David Watson, Dora, John Griffith family, Gail's family members, and Gail too, because she's been sick, um, Clinton Glenn, family of Debbie Valpel, Mark Wright, Bill Bleckley, Barry Rice, um, who did come through his surgery uh, with flying colors, of course, because that's Barry. Uh, but still keep him in his prayers, uh, in your prayers. Gerald Graves, um, Betty Wick, 
Lindy Lundy and David Watson. So all these people and others you may have, um, let's keep them in our prayers and go to our, our father at this time. Kind of change the scenery there. There we go. Everlasting God, you gave us the faith of Christ for a light to our feet amid the darkness of this world. Have pity on all who, by doubting or denying it, are gone astray from the path of safety. Bring home the truth to their hearts and grant them to receive it. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, so we offer our prayers and petitions up to you at this time. Gracious and glorious Heavenly Father, we continue to give you thanks for the beauty of your creation, even in the midst of the, the snow and the ice, we can see the wonder and the mystery of all that you've created. And we give you thanks for that. We give you thanks for the ability to worship together with one another by this means, since we can't be together in person today. We give you thanks for Jesus Christ, sent to be among us for our salvation, our redemption, we give you thanks for the hope and promise of peace and justice for all people and all nations. We give you thanks for healing and miracles. We give you thanks for this new year and this new season and all the possibilities and blessings to come this year. And we give you thanks for the church as the model of your coming kingdom. Lord, we continue to pray for all the nations of the earth and we pray for peace in the world for leadership that makes decisions based upon your divine will. We lift up those who are suffering from natural disasters all around the world, especially those that are cold and in need of proper shelter and food and basic necessities during this extreme weather. We pray for the victims and survivors of war and violence. We lift up our first responders our police, our military, and all who seek to help us and put themselves in harm's way. We pray for all the families and friends of those that are on our prayer list and others we may have in our hearts. We lift them up as we pray for all who are sick and suffering and those in pain and all those who have lost loved ones dear to them. Lord, we pray for our church and for all the churches in this community and in this world that serve in Christ's holy name. We pray that all who are lost may find a church home so that they may develop a deeper relationship with you. O oh Lord God, your chosen dwelling is the heart of the lowly. We, we give you thanks that you have revealed yourself in the holy child Jesus, thereby sanctifying all in him. Make us humble in faith and love that we may know the joy of the gospel hidden from the wise and prudent and revealed unto the young. This we ask in the name of the one, the one, the only, weary, wearying our mortal flesh, grew in wisdom and favor with God, and all people taught us to pray saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now, a couple of things we've missed. We've missed Pate playing the piano. So, but you know it's good. Okay, so he'll be back next week. Um, and then we miss taking up the offering. Don't forget those next week. It's two, it's two weeks. Okay. Um, so now it's, I, guess, I suppose it's sermon time and, and scripture time. Trying to follow along here. Uh, who writes this stuff? Anyway, um, 
our scripture today. Do you like this, though? I figured this would brighten up uh, our, our snowy days here. But our scripture, hopefully that will brighten you up, too, is from 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 29 through 31. 1 Corinthians 7, 29 through 31. What I mean, brothers and sisters, is that the time is short. From now on, those who have wishes... Let me start that over there. From now on, those who have wives should live as they do not. Those who mourn as if they did not. Those who are happy as if they were not. Those who buy something as if it were not theirs to keep. Those who use the things of the world as if not engrossed in them. For this world in its present form is passing away. And also from 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 16 through 20. 2 Corinthians 5, 16 through 20. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. So both these readings, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, 29 through 31, and 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 16 through 20. It's the word of God for the people of God. May all God's people respond. Thanks be to God. Well, looking at these two passages from our scriptures today it may seem that the that these are about contradictions and maybe just different ways of looking at things. But to really begin to understand these and the letters of Paul to the Corinthians, we must first look at the people of Corinth who they were, and why Paul wrote some of his longest and most detailed works to them. To put the region in a more modern sense, Corinth was basically in what we would call now the country of Greece. And Corinth, at the time, had quite a reputation. You've probably heard the saying about Las Vegas, that what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Well, in Corinth, a lot happened, and it didn't just stay there, everybody knew about it. It was a city known as a city of wealth and commerce. It was a center of worship for the Greek god Aphrodite. But they also worshiped Athena, Apollo, Demeter, Poseidon, and several others along with their own mythical heroes and heroines such as Medea and fairies. These temples to the gods employed many depraved customs and temple prostitutes. Along with this, there was also a sizable Jewish population there as well. And as a city of trade, you could find a mix of culture here from Romans, of course Greeks, and Asians, and some saying it was the least Greek city of all the cities in Greece. But on the more popular front, Corinth was a place of, for self-indulgence and immorality. And into this society, the Apostle Paul had successfully introduced this new system of Christianity, which was beginning to thrive. Unfortunately, some misunderstood parts of the gospel from the beginning, and they didn't grasp the meaning and the importance of Jesus' death and resurrection as they believed that he had already died and rose with Christ. Therefore, their day-to-day -day behavior really didn't matter. In addition to this, as there were so many that had come to Christianity from different secular and religious groups, 
they carried with them their own preconceived ways of doing things and their own beliefs. So even though the church was established, it was pretty much in turmoil. To put it more bluntly, it was just a mess. There were various quarreling factions and cliques of people here and there. Wealthy and poor divisions, and also people using their spiritual gifts for pride and status in the community rather than for the glory of God. Here we are now, some 50 years after the crucifixion of Jesus, with these new first century Christians, mostly Gentiles, with a, a few of everything else sprinkled in, and along with bringing all of these together in a church, Paul had the task of re-socializing them and making all feel and understand that they were part of God's kingdom. Paul's letters of instruction are trying to help them change their behaviors and their ways of thinking and calling them to live their new faith more fully and more wholesomely. So this is our context. And Paul begins by saying, what I mean as he's trying to put it in terms that they could understand. What I mean is that the time is short. It's short not only because you need to get your own life and affairs in order, but because the audience of Paul's time believed that, just have a little ding, that the audience of Paul's time believed that the second coming of Christ was during their lifetimes, just as a few years after his death and his first resurrection. So he's telling the people to stop messing around and stop putting their attention on the things of this world. Relationships don't matter. Mourning doesn't matter. Happiness, feelings you have right now, all these earthly things you have. Stop worrying about all that because it doesn't matter. In the second letter passage that we had today he says we are no longer we no longer regard anyone or things from a worldly point of view and if we are in christ we put off all the old stuff and we are a new creation in him verse 17 the old has gone and the new is here and then we are reassured of this because god has reconciled himself to us and us to him in verse 19, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. Even though from a different time, Paul's message can be relevant to us in all areas of our normal lives, especially at the beginning of a new year. I mean, we're still just in January, the first month, and the snow sort of took a week and made us change our plans, so it's still early. So in this new year, we're, we're still putting our stock into things. Are we putting things our stock into things of this world or of the next? Are there areas that we can reprioritize so that we can better enjoy our relationship and our call to walk with Jesus? If we reconcile our lives with Christ... Are there ways that we can open ourselves spiritually to hearing that soft voice of Jesus calling through the Holy Spirit that we were mentioning last week? Sometimes it's useful to reread uh, passages using other translations. The, the message translation often puts things into language that we use today. And our scriptures that we read earlier say, I do want to point out, friends, that time is of the essence. There is no time to waste, so don't complicate your lives unnecess unnecessarily. Well, tongue twister. Keep it simple. In marriage, grief, joy, whatever. Even in ordinary things, your daily routines of shopping and so on. Deal as sparingly as possible with the things the world thrusts on you. This world, as you see it, is fading away. And in the second passage, because of this decision, we don't evaluate people by what they have or what, how they look. We looked at the Messiah that way once and got it all wrong, as you know. We certainly don't look 
look on him anymore that way. Now we look inside. And what we see is that anyone united with Messiah gets a fresh start. It's created new. The old life is gone. A new life emergency emerges. Look at it. All this comes from God, who settled the relationship between us and him, and then called us to settle our relationships with each other. God put the world square with himself through the Messiah, giving the world a fresh start by offering forgiveness of sins. God has given us the task of telling everyone what he's doing. We are Christ's representatives. God uses us to persuade men and women to drop their differences and enter into God's work of making things right between them. We're speaking for Christ himself now. Become friends with God. He's already a friend with you. Keep it simple. The old life is gone. Develop our relationship with God more than focusing on the stuff of this world. That's Paul's message to the Corinthians and to us some 2,000 years later. There's a poem written back just a few years ago by a young pastor uh, named Jacob Waldron. It sort of puts all of this into, respect, into perspective, I think. It's called Church is Hard. And it goes like this. Church is hard for the person walking through the doors, afraid of judgment. Church is hard for the pastor's family under the microscope of an entire body. Church is hard for the prodigal soul returning home broken and battered by the world. Church is hard for the girl who looks like she has it all together but doesn't. Church is hard for the couple who fought the entire ride to the service. Church is hard for the single mom surrounded by couples holding hands in seemingly perfect families. Church is hard for the widow and the widower with no invitation to lunch after the service. Church is hard for the deacon with an estranged child. Church is hard for the person singing worship songs overwhelmed by the weight of the lyrics. Church is hard for the man insecure in his role as a leader. Church is hard for the wife who longs to be led by a righteous man. Church is hard for the nursery volunteer who desperately longs for a baby to love. Church is hard for the single woman and the single man praying God brings them a mate. Church is hard for the teenage girl wearing a scarlet letter, ashamed of her mistakes. Church is hard for the sinners. Church is hard for me. It is hard because on the outside it looks shiny and perfect. Sunday best in behavior and dress. However, under those layers, you find a body of imperfect people, carnal souls, selfish motives. But here is the beauty of the church. Church isn't a building, a mentality, or expectation. Church is a body. Church is a group of sinners saved by grace, living in fellowship as saints. Church is a body of believers bound as brothers and sisters by an eternal love. Church is a holy ground where sinners stand as equals before the throne of grace. Church is a refuge for broken hearts and a training ground for mighty warriors. Church is a converging of confrontation and invitation where sin is confronted and hearts are invited to seek restoration. Church is a lesson in faith and trust. Church is a bearer of bear burdens and a giver of hope. Church is a family, a family coming together, setting aside differences, forgetting past mistakes, rejoicing in the smallest of victories. Church, the body, and the circle of sinners turned saints is where he resides. And if we ask, he is faithful to come. So even on the hard days at church, the days when I am at odds with a friend, 
when I fought with my husband because we were late once again, when I've walked in bearing burdens heavier than my heart can handle, yet masking the pain with a smile on my face, when I've worn a scarlet letter under the microscope, when I've longed for a baby to hold or fought tears as the lyrics were sung, when I've walked back in afraid and broken after walking away, I'll remember Jesus has never failed to meet me there. And even though this world is passing away, we are reconciled to God. Amen. Well, hope that kind of helps you put things in perspective as we begin our month of January here in 2024. And uh, everybody has a safe uh, week as we wash some of this uh, snow and ice away and everything gets taken care of uh, over this next week or so. Um, although I won't see you this next weekend, I uh, will see you the first weekend in February. And uh, y'all be nice to, nice to Laura next week, okay? Promise. Um, and so for that, we will have our benediction. Grant, O oh Lord, that what has been said with our lips, we may believe in our hearts, and that what we believe in our hearts, we may practice in our lives. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain in you always. Amen. Have a wonderful week, a warmer week, and... We'll see you around uh, in the sunshine.